any birthdays or anniversaries today? Yeah, Turn it around. <laughs> Jeez, come on down. Day. Come on down, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> No numbers, okay. <laughs> she said 25. <laughs> uh, we have a few announcements this morning. The life groups will finish up this week. There will be no sprouts and no grow tonight and no worship service. Our worship service has been moved to Benton, to Manual, correct? Yes. Manual Baptist Church uh, for the associational business meeting and the worship service. Now, if you want to ride the bus and go to this, there's a sign-up sheet in the hall. Please sign up before you leave the church today. The bus will be leaving at around 5.15. So, uh, if you're riding, we're not taking the bus. <laughs> but anyway, if you, want to, if you want to go, please sign the list in the hall and we will uh, take the bus. If we have more than one person riding the bus. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> you meant that please, perfection. Yes, I did. You know I did that. We'll be doing trunk or treat also, and we'll be needing candy for that. So please get out and buy your candy and I guess put it in the basket in the hallway where her stuff's supposed to go for the shoe boxes, but just put candy in there and we'll figure out where it goes. Okay? Uh, the trunk or treat will be in the park October the 29th. If you would like to take part of that, come on down because I'm sure there'll be room for you to stand and watch the kids go around and hand out candy. Uh, 
Anything else? I think that's it. Nothing else we can think of. Ah, uh, see. No, I didn't know yeah. that. Oh, it made on a major copy. Well, we're going to move business meeting. It won't be this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, the 27th at 6 p.m. 27th business meeting, 6 p.m. Yeah. Here. Anything else? When are we throwing candy bags? Well, whenever we get the candy, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer, please? Thank you. We've not had a greeting in a long time, so just turn around and say hi to everybody. You know, it's sooner or later we're going to get there. <laughs> that called a wave off. That's called a wave yeah. Our next hymn is going to be page 547, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. it's so good to see you today hope you're having a, a great Sunday morning and uh, we're gonna be reading today from the book of Mark uh, chapter 12 starting in verse 41 sitting across from the temple treasury he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury many rich people were putting in large sums then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little summoning his disciples he said to them truly I tell you this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others for they all gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, just to keep you in your seats, I know you're like, oh no, preacher's getting ready to talk about me giving more money uh, in the offering. That's not what this sermon's going to be about. It's going to be about something completely different. But, uh, but there's the passage, Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. Our next hymn will be page 138 at Calvary.
praise and worship this morning. We play, pay, be blessed, the Lord, oh my soul. Did you get a score while ago? Did you get the score? Ago? I haven't yet. <laughs> Would you all please stand? Back when I was a uh, a kid at Christmas time, you know everybody looks every kid looks forward to Christmas. But what happens about halfway through the day? This day you've been waiting for for so long is slipping through your fingers, right? And it's and it's gone. That's what it is. That's what pleasure is like here on Earth. It just it comes and then it sort of goes. 
What, what were we singing that song? 10,000 years and then forevermore. That's what heaven's going to be like, where it gets started, it's good, it's good, it's good, and then it keeps on getting good. And it never, that pleasure, that joy never slips through our fingers. That's what we have to wait for, look forward to in heaven and uh, when we get to meet him in, in glory one day. All right, kids, come on down for Children's Church. I don't have a new car for you, but I, we, we'll, have a, we'll have something, something, something better, hopefully. <laughs> Who knows what they got for me? Hey there. I know you. <laughs> How we doing? <laughs> All right. Well, tell me something, before I take something out of here, tell me something exciting that you're looking forward to this week. Anything that you're looking forward to doing this week? Jenna. Playing with your friends? You're going to where? Aunt Gemma's? Izzy's. To Izzy's. To Izzy's. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand here. My hearing needs work, you guys. <laughs> All right. Going to some friend's house? That's going to be fun. That's awesome. Isn't it fun to go to friend's house? How about you like going to friend's house? Anybody else got something fun they're doing this week? Yeah. Did you have something? My niece is spending the night for a whole week. All right. Cool. Well, that's going to be fun. That's going to be great. All right. Well, you're going you're gonna to have a good time. Anybody else? Something fun? Something exciting? I'm looking forward to Friday. You're looking forward to Friday. All right. <laughs> I just want to buy pass Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> Anybody else looking forward to Friday? <laughs> I, I see that hand. I see that hand. Um, all right. Let's, let's see. Who wants to pull something out today? You want to? Have you done it recently? You haven't? Okay. Well, let's see what you got for me. I'm scared. I'm nervous. All right. A, what is this? A It's a, a Crayola marker right all right now anybody you guys have have crayons how do you how do you buy crayons on money with well with money yes <laughs> with money do you go in and you buy one crayon at a time no you buy a whole box a whole box yeah and i remember i would sometimes get that they have little box right with like six or eight but when life was good <laughs> You would get the box of 64 crayons. I don't even know if they make it anymore. Do they still make it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you got colors I, I never even knew they existed, right? A burnt sienna. What in the world is burnt sienna? And uh, all these different, different, different colors. And you take them, what, what can you do with those colors? You color with them, right. And you can draw all kinds of different things, all different shapes, all different colors, all different designs. And... That's, I love the fact that God made a universe full of color, right? Abby has a whole box of crayons right. at school. A whole box of crayons at school? That's cool. Because, you know, what would it be like if everything was just in black and white? You probably don't remember black and white TV. That was my first TV was black and white. But what if the whole world was just in black and white? It would be kind of dull, wouldn't it? Yeah, all you could color with was black, yeah. <laughs> but God made, God made a beautiful world with all kinds of different colors, and it just shows how, how creative he is, how, how wonderful he is, and how beautiful this world that he has made. And just look at you guys. You all look, you all look beautiful and handsome today, but you all look different from each other. And God's made you all look a little bit different from one another because that's how creative that God is, all right? And so just remember that when you look in the mirror and you look in, you look in the mirror one day and just realize God made you that way. He made you that way because he was being artistic and he was being creative in making you the way that you are. And know that you're a special because you're made by God's hands and you're made in his image, all right? You can go to Children's Church today. And I think we, that's yours. Oh, I don't want to take your, now you've, now you just need 63 more. All right. <laughs> All right. Now we've got a special group coming to us right now. Jan and Carol, come on ahead. 
they didn't like being called a group, a, a duo today. You want the mics? Oh, okay. I hope they're on. Go ahead. Use that one. And she'll use this one. There you go. It's, it should be on. Yeah. Yep, you're over here. Is it on? Yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I hope I don't sound that loud. <laughs> I'm not used to it yet. <laughs> Kurt sounds a lot better up there today, doesn't he? <laughs> While they're looking for that. It's just got what's all gone this C D. Okay. Oh, okay. Terry, lead in their testimony time. Ask for testimonies of something God's doing in their life. We'll find that really quick. Okay. <laughs> what's happening? Okay. Get it. Life is easy when you're, you're up on the mountain and you've got peace like you've, you've never known. known. But then things change and you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, child, you are never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. Things go wrong, He'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. God of the day is still God in the night. You talk of faith when we're up on the mountain. But talk come to we see when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley of trials and temptation. That's when faith is really put to the test. Oh, the God of the mountain. It's the God in the valley. Things go wrong. He'll make them right. And the God of the good times is to God in the bad times. God of the day is still God in the night. God of the day is still God in the night. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane and Carol. It was well worth the wait, wasn't it? Thank you, Carissa. 
she was filling in for Kurt who just got a phone call from work that he had to take. So that's why we had a little technological glitch there. Well, it's good to be here today with you and I hope you're enjoying worshiping the Lord today. We are going to be in Mark chapter 12 again, uh, verse 41. Um, one of my favorite uh, baseball players was David Eckstein. Uh, how many remember him? Little bitty guy, all right? One, he didn't have much talent. Definitely wasn't a very big guy, not, not strong enough. If you looked at him on the street, you wouldn't think, well, there's a, a baseball player who won the World Series. But what he had, he gave it all. And he got the most out of what he had. And we're going to look at a woman in the Bible who, who didn't have much, really didn't have anything. But God got all that she had. And uh, so today I'm going to title this sermon, What Jesus Sees and What Jesus Uses. And uh, so look with me there at Mark 12, verse 41 through 44. I know I've read it already, but let's read it one more time, and then we'll have prayer. It says, sitting across from the temple treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom today. You would give us understanding and help us to see what we can learn from this, this woman who lived 2,000 years ago. Help us to see her sacrifice Help us to see her dedication and help us as we serve you, as we do things for you, that we might look to her as an example of giving it all that we have, giving all that we've got for you. Minister to our hearts, Lord, today. Help us to see today how valuable we can be in service to you if we're giving it all to you if we're dedicating it to you and we're depending completely upon you today. Thank you, God. Open our hearts to you now, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this passage, we see two groups of people that are highlighted. Number one, we see a, a group of very wealthy people, um, and they're, they're putting in large amounts of money into the temple treasury. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. That's great that they're doing that. But we also see a, a poor uh, uh, widow woman who put in almost the smallest amount possible. Okay, you probably don't have a coin that small that you could put into the treasury, um, into the offering. And that, but that's what she gave, almost the smallest amount possible. Now, the first thing I want you to see here today is that your financial prosperity or your financial want. Neither one of those is a sign of God's favor or displeasure with you. Okay? If you make six figures a year, that doesn't mean God loves you more than when you were making four figures a year or three figures a year. God doesn't look and make distinctions based on money or based on financial status. He never has. He never will. We can see from what Jesus says, um, in verses 43 and 44, that he doesn't have more of a relationship with the rich people than he does with this poor woman. God doesn't love Bill Gates because he has lots of money more than he loves you or me. Okay? There is no distinction financially. And folks, God doesn't love you more or give you more of a salvation if you put one coin in the offering plate as opposed to another. All right? So finances does not win God's favor or pull us out of God's favor. Now, this is different than how the world looks at us, right? This is different than how the world judges the rich and the poor, right? Forbes magazine every year prints the 400 richest people in the world magazine. Anybody, anybody in that magazine? I uh, didn't think so. It prints the 400 richest people. You don't see, though, the 400 poorest people in the world. They don't print that magazine, right? Because we put a distinction like the important people are the ones with money, right? Well, folks, there's coming a day. There's coming a day in heaven. It's not going to matter how much money you had, right? It's not going to matter how much 
uh, you've got in the bank. That doesn't matter. Robin Leach, back in the 80s, hosted that show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, right? He didn't host Lifestyles of the Poor and Downtrodden. Because we, we're not interested in that, right? We are interested in how does, how does these so-called wealthy, important people, how do they live? That's what we're interested in. And yet God thinks differently. God does not judge people based on their financial status. Now, he does say often how easy it is for us to let money push us to depend on it instead of God, right? Um, that's why he says it's easier for a camel. He's using an exaggeration here. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for what? Than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Is that because God doesn't like rich people? No, it just means that when you've got a lot of money, you end up depending on it, leaning on it, focusing on it, instead of reaching up for God, who is who you need. Right? And so that's, that's what happens to us. Now, before we get too smug, keep in mind that nine-tenths of the world would look at you and I as the rich people. Okay? We're, I know you don't think of yourself as that way, but you go to any place that I've traveled in the world, what we have is rich. What we have is filthy rich. When I went to Uganda, I had, I had guys begging me for money. These were middle-class people in the country. They were begging me to give them a little bit of money because they looked at me as rich. I was only making about $16,000 a year at that point in my life. And they were, they were thinking I was wealthy and rich. We have, and we, what we need to make sure of is we don't ha take what we have, what God has given us, and use that as a reason not to depend on him. But God doesn't love rich people more than poor people. And folks, he doesn't love poor people more than rich people either. And what he wants us to do is imitate him with, with the people we come into contact with, the people who come into our church, the people who come into this community. We should never, ever consider or make a judgment based on what they have or what they don't have. James gives us an example in James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. He says, for if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there, stand over there or sit here on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, and what he's saying there is, is that's what these people were doing, actually. And he says, don't do that. Don't make distinctions based on that. Um, a guy I mentioned to my dad one time, he said, now, Bill, I don't understand. We're always going to visit people, but we always go to visit people who live in these poor, run-down houses. Why don't we ever go visit the rich people up on top of the hill? Now, he was saying it kind of joking, kind of sarcastically. But there was a little bit of truth in what he was saying. Is, you know, do, do, uh, do people in nice houses need Jesus? You bet they do. You bet people who have lots of money. You think they've got everything going for them because they got money. Guess what? They need Jesus. Do people in poor houses, poorer houses I should say, need Jesus? You bet they do. The point is, and I think the point the guy was making to my father is, we shouldn't be paying attention to what kind of house the person lives in, right? We should just go where? Where the people are. Where the people are. We must look at all people, whether their wallets are full or whether their wallets are not full, simply as people in need of redemption by Jesus Christ. That's the only distinction we should make between anybody. We can let the world um, divide us into different um, groups of people and different um, different standards and different classes. But folks, we as a church need to divide people in two ways. Those who have Jesus and those that we need to tell about that they can have Jesus. Those who have Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. Jesus ate with tax collectors because he didn't view them as wealthy tax collectors. He viewed them as people who just needed him. He didn't say, well, look at this guy. I don't want to eat supper with him because he's, he's wealthy, he's got money, and I know he got it by being dishonest. I knew he got it by being deceptive with it. He didn't do that. He said, that's the person who needs me. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to eat dinner with that person. Jesus sat down and talked with the Samaritan woman who was probably of a very low social status, 
probably very poor. But he sat down and talked with her because he didn't see her as a woman who was a failure at relationships and a failure at life. He saw her as a woman who needed him. And folks, we'll begin to change how we think about people when we begin to see people through, those, through that lens and that lens only as people who need Jesus and to make those distinctions. Well, the secret to thinking like Jesus, secret to thinking like Jesus does is looking at what Jesus looks at. Okay? When God was choosing Israel's first king, uh, or second king, I should say, um, God brought all the, they, they brought the, the sons of Jesse by, and they were looking at them like, oh, we've got a king here. Look at these guys. They're handsome. They're strong. They're obviously competent. They're powerful. They're mighty. God has found a king among these boys. And they all came by, and God rejected every single one of them. Said, no, nope, this one is not the king. And they brought in the youngest son, who they didn't even want to have show up because they thought, no way God's going to choose him to be king. Because he's just out there keeping sheep. He's the youngest. He's not, he's not the, uh, the one that uh, people would look at and be impressed by. And who did God choose? He chose that youngest son, David, to be his king. And he said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks where? God looks on the heart, right? That's what we've got to look past, is people's outward appearance, whatever that might be, whether it's they're wealthy or whether they look different than we do or whether they are different than us, and look through past all of that and see who they really are on the inside, who they really are in their heart. You see, in this story with this widow woman and the rich people putting money into the treasury, everyone was looking at all of the external things. They looked at the clothing of the people. Now, be honest, have you ever done that when you walk into a room? You look at the clothing somebody's wearing? Do you ever judge them by that? Don't, don't feel bad, because everybody around you is doing the, has done the same thing, all right? We all have done that. But everyone was looking at the external things, looking at the clothing of the people. They saw the coins that, they, that were being put in. But Jesus looked beyond all of the pomp. Jesus looked beyond all of the circumstance, and he saw through to those people's hearts. And folks, that's the magician's trick, right? The magician's trick is to get his or her audience to be looking at, at something else, be looking at one thing, so we don't see what's really happening, so we don't see what the magician's really doing. And that, that's what Jesus does. While everyone else is looking at what's on the outside, he is seeing something completely different. He's seeing not the coins that they're putting in, not how much that they're putting in, but he is seeing what's motivating the rich man. And he is seeing what's motivating the widow and why they are putting in what they're putting in. And I'm telling you what, to Jesus, that's a whole lot more important than the amount, is the why. Is what has led a person to do what they're doing. The motive, folks, changes everything. The motive tells a totally different story. In fact, when we get to heaven, God's going to see our motives and our rewards that are going to be given to us, they're going to be determined not by how much we've done, but they're going to be determined by our heart when we did it. Where was our heart when we did what we did? Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. So what's going to happen is we're going to get up there and we're going to be brought to receive our rewards, and God's going to test the works that we did. And the fire, what does fire do? It, 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 it tests the purity of something, right? And it's going, to, it's going to test how pure is what we did. Is what Chris Hansen did, was it for himself, to glorify himself? Or is what Chris Hansen did for you, or more importantly, for God, right? Where was his motives? Let me give you another example. Billy Graham is already in heaven right now. I think Billy Graham's going to have lots of rewards, but his rewards are not going to be based on the number of people who walked down an aisle and accepted Christ. Okay? They're not. Because you see, and I don't think this is the reason he did it, but if Billy Graham did what he did for himself in some way, you know how many rewards he's going to have in heaven from all those people that walked down the aisle? Zero. Right? It's not going to be based on 
on success. It's not going to be based on results. It's going to be based on motive. I think we're going to see Billy Graham holding a lot of rewards. All right? He's going to need a couple other arms probably um, to, to carry what he had. But Because I think he did it with a purity of heart. But folks, it's all going to be based on why did we do what we did? And I want you to think about that for a minute. Why do you do what you do? Why do you live the life that you live? Is our, our lives lived just for ourselves? Let me tell you. If our life, if your life is lived just for you, you're making your life about something much less than what God wants to make it about. But if we make our lives about God, if we make our lives about what God is doing through other people, if I make my life about what God wants to do in your life, it doesn't matter whether I'm successful or whether I'm accomplished or not. What matters is, is that God is doing something successful in somebody else's life. And that's where the pure motive is. That's where God wants us to be. And when we live like that, well, we're going to have rewards in heaven coming out of everywhere. All right? Now, after Jesus watches this scene, he gathers his disciples together for kind of a debriefing. Look what he says there in verses 43 and 44. All the people that put their money in, the rich and this poor woman. Listen to what Jesus says. I think it shocks the disciples. It says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And they're thinking right now, well, Jesus doesn't have a grasp on math very well. I mean, we, they could tell there's no way that they, she put in more. But listen to what she says. He says, for they all gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. You see, in Jesus' eyes, it wasn't the size of the gift that mattered but it was the sacrifice that she had made. Again, it was the motive. It was the heart behind it. And uh, yeah, the rich people gave a large amount, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not bashing them in any way, shape, or form. The rich man gave a large amount, but the problem is it didn't hurt them, right? Because what were they giving, according to what Jesus said? They were giving it out of their what? Out of their surplus. So yes, they gave a lot, but when they got done giving a lot, what did they have? They had a lot, okay? And they had a lot left over. And so um, uh, the widow, though, what did she give? Two tiny, measly little coins. Those coins mentioned were the, the smallest coins in circulation in all of Palestine. Both of them put together, they equaled 1 64th of a Roman denarius. Uh, a Roman denarius was normally worth about a day's wage for a laborer, okay? She gave 1 64th of a day's work. So if it was a 10-hour work day, my math may be off a little bit here, but if it was a 10-hour work day, she put in about 10 minutes worth of work. That's it. That's all she gave. But Jesus says she gave more than anybody else. Why? Somebody said it just a minute ago. It's all she had. Yeah, it was all she had. And so it was a much greater sacrifice. And since it was a much greater sacrifice, it was a much greater gift. Now, of course, we can apply this to, to giving your money to the church. Now, God wants us to give out of our surplus, but that he wants us to give it, not, not out of our surplus, but he wants it, us to give out of a sacrifice. But that's another sermon, folks, for another day. I think there's something maybe even more important that we need to see here. I want to see this a little bit differently. You see, God doesn't just call us to give money. God calls each of us to serve him, whether it's with our tithes and offerings or whether it's with our gifts, our skills, and our abilities. And I'm going to be honest with you, I think sometimes we don't serve because we don't think we have the ability to do so. We don't think we have anything in our, our not our physical wallet, but in our wallet of our physical skills and our abilities. We don't think we have anything to offer. So instead of growing mightily for God as we serve, we become kind of a shrinking violet as we sit back and let someone else do the work and at the same time let someone else get the blessing for the work that they're doing. God says, I want you to look at this widow. She probably wondered, I bet that morning, I bet she wondered, 
why do I even bother going all the way to the temple today? All I got is two measly old coins. What good is that going to do anybody? Why do I even bother giving it to them? These other people are going to give so much, I bet mine might even get lost in the bottom of the bag. They might not even notice them. They don't need my money. She probably thought, what's the purpose? Why bother? But that's not what she did, right? She gave not out of her surplus, but she gave out of her poverty. And folks, if God will supply what we need when we give monetarily to him, and he will, he will supply what we need when we give all that we have by serving him. All right? In other words, we need to serve God, not because we think we're good at something. All right? We need to not think, well, you know what? I'm going to figure out what I'm really good at, and that's the only thing I'm going to do. All right? I'd be still looking for something to do. Right? We need not serve God out of our ability, not because we think we're good at something, but we need to serve God out of our poverty of our ability, out of our poverty of strength, because that is when God will be free to work mightily in us. Because I don't care if it is something that you are good at. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you from experience. Even if it's something that you're good at, you're going to come to a place where you're going to find out you're not good enough on your own. All right? You're not good enough to do on your own what God has called you to do. Nobody is. Paul found that out. Peter found that out. Everybody finds that out, that they're not good enough on their own. And that's why we have to serve out of the poverty of our ability, out of the poverty of our strength. One of my favorite passages, probably the most favorite passage of the Bible, is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is very personal. And he says, I got a problem. And I prayed for this problem to go away for a long time. He calls it his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. Some people think it was eyesight problems. Some people think it was epilepsy. Some people think it was some other things. We don't know exactly what it was. But he had some kind of issue, and it bothered him. And he thought to himself, God, if you just get rid of this, then I could really do something for you. If, I, if you just get rid of this, then I could be free to really serve you and do a great job for you. And what did God say to Paul? I'm not doing it. I'm not getting rid of it. And he says um, in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected, not in your good skills and abilities, but it's perfected in what? In weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. Let me tell you what, I could give a big laundry list of things I wish I were better at in life, right? And you could give a long list of things, right, too, that you wish you were better at. But like I just told the kids, you're made the way God made you for a purpose. And part of the reason he made you the way he made you is so that you can serve him in a specific way for him, in a way you would never have chosen on your own, but also in a way that causes you to never depend on yourself but to always depend on him, right? And so that's what we have to do. We have to look at this woman who gave all that she had, and it was nothing. We need to look and say, you know what, God, I don't think I'm good enough to do some of the things you've called me to do. I don't think I can handle what you've called me to do. And we need to look at this woman and say, you know what? If she was able to give all that she had of her money, and I can give the little I've got of my skills and abilities and my strength. And I can give it to you, God. And I can wait and see what you're going to do with it. Let me tell you, folks, I've come back to that passage time and time and time again in my life. And folks, if you truly serve God, and you truly do something for him, you will come back to this passage time and time again. Because we will find out that if God's grace isn't sufficient for us, we're going to fall flat on our face. And when we do fall flat on our face, we need to recognize, you know what? We just have to depend on God. We just have to depend on God to pick us back up. D.L. Moody, who's a great preacher from Chicago, something good does come out of Chicago. Um, Deal, he wrote in his Bible, right next to Isaiah uh, 6, verse 8, where it says, who should I send? Who will go for us? He wrote, I am only one. 
but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. Folks, stop trying to be the hero. Stop trying to save the world and think, well, you know what, I can't do all these things, so I'm not going to do anything. Just do whatever God puts in your lap, right? Now, there's not, you've got to say no to some things, all right? You've got to say no to some things. There's going to be some things that I ask you to do, and you're going to say, no, nah, that's not for me, preacher, and that, that's, that no is coming right from God, okay? Because you know that's not God's will, all right? But God's going to put other things in your lap, and you're going to think, I don't know if I can do that. And when you say, I don't know if I can do that, you know what God says? I got you right where I want you. I got you right where I want you. Because if you can't, if you admit that you can't do it, then God says, now I'm free to be able to do it. But if I say, yeah, God, I think I can handle that. I think I can handle preaching at Cessar First Baptist Church. And I can handle visiting people, doing Bible studies, leading youth group. And I, I can do all that, God, no problem. You know what, can, what happens if I, th I had that attitude? That's if I can't work now. Chris works. Chris does it. But what Chris does isn't worth that much. But what God does, God can do what we can't imagine or think. And so the answer is not to just say yes to everything. I'm not saying that. But what you do is, God, I'm praying. I want you to lead me. I want you to show me what you want me to do. And when he does show something to you, and it seems too big for you, it seems too great for you, but he keeps showing it to you, and he keeps revealing it to you, and he keeps putting this on your heart, and putting it on your mind, say, God's grace is sufficient for me. And I will glory in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can live in me. I, I hardly ever do this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a poem to close the service. Tammy's rubbing off on me. She gave me a few poems this week. But I read this one, um, and um, I just, uh, I, this just spoke to my heart this week. And so just listen to the poem. I think you see some of the words up there if you can read them. Um, but uh, just listen in and let this speak to your heart. The master was searching for a vessel to use. On the shelf there were many. Which one would he choose? Take me, cried the gold one. I'm shiny and bright. I'm of great value and I do things just right. My beauty and luster will outshine the rest. And for someone like you, Master, gold would be best. Unheeding, the Master passed on to the brass. It was wide-mouthed and shallow and polished like glass. Hear, hear, cried the vessel. I know I will do. Place me on your table for all men to view. Look at me, called the goblet of crystal so clear. My transparency shows my content so dear. Though fragile am I, I will serve you with pride. And I'm sure I'll be happy your house to abide. The master came next to a vessel of wood. Polished and carved, it solidly stood. You may use me, dear master, the wooden bowl said. But I'd rather you use me for fruit, not for bread. Then the master looked down and saw a vessel of clay. Empty and broken, it helplessly lay. No hope had the vessel that the master might choose to cleanse and make whole, to fill and to use. Ah, this is the vessel I've been hoping to find. I will mend and use it and make it all mine. I need not the vessel with pride of itself, nor the one who is narrow to sit on the shelf, nor the one who is big mouthed and shallow and loud, nor one who displays his content so proud, nor the one who thinks he can do all things just right, but this plain earthy vessel filled with my power and might. Then gently he lifted the vessel of clay, mended and cleansed it and filled it that day. Spoke to it kindly, there's work you must do. Just pour out to others as I pour in to you. Folks, I think that's God's message to each of us today. You're made the way you're made, okay? And he says he wants to use you the way you are. He wants you to pour yourself out into other people's lives. Your family, your church, this community, the people you work with. He wants, to pour your, he wants you to pour yourself out to them. And guess what he's going to do when you pour yourself out to other people? Yeah, he's going to pour himself into you. And he's going to fill you and give you the strength to do it 
and to keep doing it. And there's going to be days where you're going to say, I can't do it today, God. And what's he going to do? He's going to pour a little bit more in. He's going to pour a little bit more in. I can tell you, there's been a couple Sunday mornings and several Monday mornings where I said, God, I can't do it. And God pours a little bit more in. And he pours a little bit more in. And folks, whatever God calls you to do, you can't do it. But God can do it through you. God can do it through you. Whatever it is that he is asking you to do. Whatever it is, not, not what someone else is asking you to do, but what God is asking you to do. You can do it. Just trust in him and lean completely upon his sufficiency. Lean completely upon his grace. And folks, he will do things that you would never have imagined that he could do. Nothing, nothing more than just relying and depending on him. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you think, how could God love me? Well, folks, if God could love you, he could, if God could love me, he could certainly love you. And all you have to do is say, I can't do it, God. I can't. I can't find forgiveness. I can't earn my way. I have to just trust in you. Trust in your grace completely. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Would you do that today? Christian, if you're here today and you're thinking, you know what? I, I, need, to, I need to stop. I need to stop pushing things off that I think I can't do. I need to start listening to what God says. Do that today. Just listen to God's voice. And say, God, whatever it is, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Not because I'm good enough to do it, but because you're good enough to do it through me. Will you do that? Will you trust in him? Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you today. For this simple woman, who probably thought her that was the last thing she was going to do. She was going to put two coins in and that was probably going to be it. And yet 2,000 years later, we're still being served by her example. But every time I get up and preach, Lord, it's the example of that widow who gave all that she had, gave out of her poverty. That's the example that I have to follow. No matter when anybody preaches or when anybody shares your word or anybody teaches a Sunday school class or, or, um, or serves in a nursery or anything, they do it not with their own strength, but they do it with the strength that you supply. We serve God out of our poverty. We serve out of our poverty using your surplus of, sub of resources, your surplus of strength, your surplus of ability, your surplus of skills that you will pour into us as we follow you, as we live for you. God, help us, Lord. Help us to depend on you and to trust in you entirely, completely, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a song? Please stand. I have decided to follow Jesus. Whatever God's leading you to do, maybe to join this church, be baptized, accept Him as your Savior and Lord, or maybe just commit more of your life to Him. I Would you do that as we sing? to follow continue to play, would you bow your head and close your eyes and just talk to God. Just ask Him right now, God, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you are calling me to do? Tune out all the voices. Try to tune mine out in just a moment. Tune out all the voices. Just listen to what He has to say to you right now.